The first three verses of Hosea 6 are a follow-on from the previous verse in chapter 5, verse 15, where it says, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And so in the first three verses here of Hosea 6, we see that they begin to express their repentance in that day that is to come, that is with the return of Christ in the future. So beginning in Hosea 6 and verse 1, it says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. So again, the word here for return, shub, is the word that's used for repent throughout the Old Testament. So let us repent and return to God. Let's stop going the wrong direction. Let's turn 180 degrees around and go the right direction. And so it says that God had torn them. He had punished them. He had punished them and he had stricken them for a purpose, right? It's to get their attention, to bring them to this repentance, so then it also says here that he will heal us, he will bind us up. So again, his, his purpose isn't to tear down for no reason, but he will then, once the people turn to him and they seek him and they have the right frame of mind, he will restore them and he will forgive them. So what was happening is the Israelites were seeking God. They were seeking refuge in the wrong place, right? Back in chapter 5 and verse 13, what did they do when they saw their sickness and they saw their wound? Well, they went to Assyria, to King Jerob, who could not cure them. That's where they were looking. And we'll see this as we go through even chapter 7, that they continue to look to the wrong place, to the wrong people, to the wrong quote-unquote powers that be. And they continue to allow themselves to be subject to the wrong influences. So the problem is that at the root of all this is spiritual. There's spiritual problems. And God is the only one who can rectify this. Verse 2, And after two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Now, one of the reasons that I wanted to take a break from Hosea before we went through Hosea 6 here and to do the messages on the seven seals, specifically the fifth seal, which is the great tribulation and then the seventh, the day of the Lord, was specifically for this verse here. Now, some people think that this points to the resurrection of Christ. Well, a couple problems. He wasn't raised on the third day. And also here it's talking about he will revive us. And the context is, again, talking about Israel and Judah. Now, Christ gave, he said, one sign in, in Matthew 12, 40, he says that I'm going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, just like Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, right? So when you go through the gospels, you see in John that it was in three days, so it could be no more than 30, 72 hours. And Mark, it was after three days, so it had to be no less than 72 hours. And then Matthew 16 and 21 says the third day, so it had to be no less than 48 and no more than 72 hours. Now, there is only one amount of time that satisfied all three of these conditions, and that is that he was in the ground for 72 hours, for exactly 72 hours. So again, he couldn't be raised on the third day. So he says, again, he will raise us up. So these three verses that we're going through here at the beginning of the chapter are talking about the repentance of Israel and Judah. And what we do and what we see here is that we apply the day for the year. You put Numbers 14, 34, Ezekiel 4, 6 in your notes, which gives us this prophetic principle that sometimes a day refers to a year. So what we have then is that after two days, and to me this is the situation, considering that this is an end-time prophecy that we're talking about, and we'll see more of that that is referring to the end-time, can only be referring to the end-time, some of this stuff, but that after two days refers to the Great Tribulation. And so this is what we were talking about back in 
in Daniel 7, verse 25, Revelation 12, 14, Revelation 11, 2, and 3, of the three and a half years that are to come, it's uh, it talks about 42 months. It talks about 1,260 days of this time here in the end, of which what we see is that, and again, we can walk, work backwards, is that the day of the Lord, a day for the year, the day of the Lord is going to be approximately a year, accounting for this time, that he will probably have to cut it short so that the elect would be saved alive. Then, so we have then is uh, the Great Tribulation lasting approximately two and a half years before the day of the Lord stops starts. So we have this terminology here then in verse uh, two of Hosea six. It says, after two days, he will revive us. So this two and a half years to me is satisfied by this, uh, this phrase, this terminology of the after the two days. So after these two years that he will revive us is that what we see then is the great tribulation is this time of punishment on physical and spiritual Israel. Again, a time of chastisement to bring them around, to help them see the error of the ways and to turn back to God. And then after that time, right, it will then shift and it'll be the time of God's wrath on the world. Those who have been persecuting his people and those who uh, are, are subject to the wrath and indignation of God for not living the right way and doing the right thing all this time. And so then on the third day, right? So after two, after two and a half years, which is on the third day, so you have the first day, second day, and then two, the second and a half, two and a half. On the third day, he will raise us up. So then we have this time where the Israelites and the Jews, the people of Judah, who have gone into captivity into the four corners of the world, are then going to be protected until the return of Christ, until he can come and bring them into the promised land. So, of course, this implies that they're they're not going to die, that they're going to have a certain amount of protection. And again, I'm not going to belabor the point because we've done a whole message on what, what we call the, uh, the second exodus, where God goes and gathers his people, brings them into the land of promise. So, again, what we see, though, is that... that uh, supernaturally, Christ is going to intervene in their lives, right, and protect them and give them the necessary shelter to be able to last until his return. Hosea 6 and verse 3. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. So again, he says, okay, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. And, you know, if you go back to Hosea 4, verse 6, which is one of our memorization scriptures and is a, a key scripture to this whole book, it says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, they went into captivity in the past. They're going to go into captivity in the future because they failed to retain the knowledge of God, okay, the things that he had told them, the things he had spoken to them, the things that we have all been given in the words of the Bible, okay, because of that, you know, they suffered. Right? Again, they failed to follow, so cursings follow with disobedience. With blessings, or with uh, obedience comes blessings. So again, the admonition here then is to we need to do what's right this time. So we will need to follow and pursue the knowledge of God. His going forth is established as the morning. So it's as sure as the sun is going to rise in the east. And then he says this interesting little phrase, the, the latter and former rain to the earth. So the latter rain fell in March and April and fell a little bit sometime before the harvest. The former rain fell in what corresponds to our September and October at the time that they were uh, to be doing the seeding and sowing. Now, so the reason that the order is interesting to me here is that almost, and I think it's everywhere else in the Bible, it's, it says the former and latter rains, latter meaning later, right? And 
what we see, okay, and this kind of corresponds to me, it corresponds to the fulfillment of the holy days. So again, it's interesting that it calls it the latter rain, meaning later, yet what we see in the fulfillment of the holy days is that the first coming, okay, he, he fulfilled, he's fulfilling the feast of the, the Passover season. With the second coming, he's completing the meaning of the fall festivals. So this is also the order of the resurrection. So the first fruit, depicted by the first and the smaller uh, harvest season in the spring and then in the summer, and then the greater harvest represented by the fall festival. So you had the, uh, the Christ during the Passover, then you had the Pentecost, which is the first fruits, the first resurrection of the people being called now, and then the greater harvest yet in the fall. Okay, so we see this progress of the way that the uh, the resurrections and the harvest happens from the smallest, from the, the wave sheaf to the first fruits to the greater harvest. But what we have, though, is that it's called the latter rains. The latter rain, though, corresponds to the first resurrection. And then the former rain refers to the later bigger resurrection. And so in verse 3, it says he's going to come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain. So he's coming to us, okay, the latter one first, the, the first fruit. So to me, it, it's a, you know, he's telling us, you know, this order. And it's almost making a point of it here since he's everywhere else in, in throughout the Bible. It says the former and the latter rains. But here it says, yes, I'm coming. Okay, I already came. I'm coming with my first fruits to get my first fruits and then to work towards then the former rain in the later fall season. All right, so that's the first three verses. So now to Hosea 6 and verse 4. We have a little change of pace here. He says, O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud and like the early dew, it goes away. So he's kind of saying, what am I going to do with you? If we're going to put it in our kind of modern vernacular. Your faithlessness now is like, again, this is before the return of Christ, is like a morning cloud. Right? He wants them to be more than just this promise of goodness, this promise of rain coming. Right? He wants this to be more than something that's just going to evaporate into nothing as the day progresses. But he's saying, Ephraim, Judah, this is what you are like. You you're, you're, have the promise in the morning and it eventuates into nothing as the day goes along. It all goes away. Verse 5, therefore, okay, because of what comes before, that's what therefore means, okay, okay, so because of this, because of the way you're acting, because of what you're doing, is I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And your judgments are, the, are like light that goes forth. Okay, so these judgments are very enlightening, as it were. So we have Hosea kind of following the admonition of a prophet, of, of what... The, the teachers and leaders are supposed to be doing. We see that, again, countless times in Isaiah 58, verse 1, which says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Right? And, and this, is, this is the nature of the word of God. Like Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the, to the division of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow. And it's like a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So this is how God has hewn them by the words of the prophet and slain them by his words. He's told them, and it should be cutting them, okay, like the word of God is, to their soul, to their heart. And yet, what's happening now? So the word of God then 
has come and has told them how to be and said, okay, this is what's going to happen if you are not that way as well. So it's going to be a just recompense on these people, right? And the timing of this is that, okay, yes, they have captivity ahead of them and trying to tell them, you've got to change, you've got to be different. And this is the word to everyone now. I know we don't want to hear it and we don't believe it. Maybe some are starting to begin to see the cracks in the armor, as it were, that this nation could fall, but it is going to fall for cause. Because we are supposed to be the people of God, setting this example, living by the word of God, and reflecting our appreciations for the, the blessings that God has bestowed on upon us because of his promises that he made to, to Abraham so, so many years ago. Yet they don't. And because of that, these things are going to happen in the very near future. Verse 6. For I desire mercy. And this word mercy is the same word as faithfulness in verse 4. It has this connotation of kindness and goodness. But he says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now, again, another very super helpful verse to understand the mind of God. So many people believe that there is two different gods, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, when in fact they're the same God. They just don't view him through the correct lens. Right? God, right, in spite of what you might think in terms of him being uh, and having to, I guess, show the wrath that's necessary, right? It's like a father who disciplines their children, like parents with a kid, right? Is, is that, and again, and, and I can attest to the same fact as well, is that you don't want to discipline your children. You have to discipline them. You don't want to. You would rather that they just be the way that they're supposed to be. God would rather his people to be merciful, to be this kind, good, faithful people, children, rather than to sacrifice anything, whether it's the blood of bulls and goats, whether it's uh, the punishments that they have to go through, the captivity. He would rather not have to do that. He wants us to do what is right or righteous instead of wrong and having to be corrected for it. And he also says, you know, he, he would rather that they have the knowledge of God more than these burnt offerings. Right? Hosea 4, 6 again said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So God doesn't want them or any animals to have to die. He just wants them to live life correctly, to live it right, and to be blessed and, and prosper in doing so. So now we, we have this change in tone. But instead of verse 6, right? Instead of the mercy and the knowledge of God, what, what did he get? He says, verse 7, But like men, they transgress the covenant, and they have dealt treacherously with me. So the, the treacherous dealing, meaning that they had violated the trust and faith that they had pledged to God. They said, all that you have said, we will do. And it was a conditional promise. God says, well, if you do this, then I will do this. You know, some of it was conditional on them. But yet they were the ones that transgressed the covenant. The covenant wasn't the problem. It was the people. Hebrews 8, verses 6 through 9. Hebrews 8, verses 6 through 9. It says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry and as much as he is also mediator, okay, speaking of Christ, the resurrected Christ, of a better covenant, which was established on better promises, meaning the new covenant. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second, okay? Okay, because finding fault with them, with the people, 
Okay, not the covenant, not the, um, the, the God's fault, not the conditions of the covenant. And the covenant just means agreement that they all agree to. He says, but finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And again, it was a marriage covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. So, again, he's saying here, okay, this is what I wanted, but this is what you did. He said, like men, they transgressed the covenant. And so then God, you know, they dealt trust us with God. And then God then says, okay, now there's going to be a punishment that has to be exacted. And in that sense, he disregarded them. So back to Hebrews 6 and verses 8 and 9. So now we begin to see how the people were just getting more and more off track. In Hosea 6 and verse 8, it says, Gilead is a city of evil doers and defiled with blood. You know, we'll see later in Hosea 12, 11 that Gilead had idols. But as bands of robbers lie in wait for a man, so the company of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Surely they commit lewdness. All right, so the priests of all people were supposed to be leading people towards God, and here they are acting in this most lascivious manner. Now, here's the interesting thing about this, is that these were cities of refuge, and they were no longer safe harbors. And we, we did a whole series, on not a series, but a message on the cities of refuge, where people who had accidentally committed um, like a, a manslaughter, that they could go there to a city of refuge and they could not, uh, you know, blood for blood could not be exacted upon them by the, uh, the family member of, of who the person that was slain. And they got to stay there until the priest then died. And again, it was all symbolic of you know, seeking refuge in Christ and the high priest uh, being Christ, uh, that he became our high priest. And, and, and so on and so forth. But the, the, the point here is that, that these were places of refuge. So Deuteronomy 19, verses 3 and 4, just want to show you that real quick, that they were instructed to not only build the cities, but they had to prepare the way to the cities. Okay, all very symbolic, but also then very necessary for this physical nation. Deuteronomy 19, verses 3 and 4, it says, You shall prepare roads for yourselves and divide into three parts the territory of your land, which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, that any manslayer may flee there. And this is the case of the manslayer who flees there, that he may live, whoever kills his neighbor unintentionally, not having hated him in time past. So they were also supposed to put up signs making it very obvious where they're supposed to go to get to this place of safety, the city of refuge. And as you see here, it says, okay, you could divide the land into three parts so that there's one that's reasonably close to everybody throughout the land of Israel so that they could get there okay, before somebody was able to exact some type of vengeance upon them for this unintentional killing of their relative. So, again, this is how important it was. It was so that they may live in these cases. And they prepared and they gave signs and they put them close. And what was happening? You know, the priests of all people were the ones murdering on the way to Shechem. Okay? So there was, again, this way to get to there and the priests were the ones that were the problem. They're doing the exact opposite of what they were supposed to be doing. And they were should have been held to a higher, and they were held to a higher standard because they knew what this was. And they had a job and they didn't do it. In Joshua 20, verses 7 through 9. In fact, uh, let's see. 
we might just, I might just leave that. You can just put that in your notes. But again, just kind of showing where they were, okay, and that they needed to get there. And, um, you know, it talks about Shechem and Ramoth and Gilead. And, and telling just, again, how they're appointed for these people who might accidentally kill somebody and have to flee there. But again, you can go look at it on the map. It's interesting to see on the map. And it, again, it kind of brings to light and highlights uh, verses 8 and 9 of Hosea 6 in, in terms of what they were doing and how they were cutting off their way to safety. So again, it was tantamount to them. These cities were a type of Christ. And the only hope that some of them had, the guilty, that could go and find safety was in one of these three cities. And so because of that, not three cities, but uh, three divided parts of your territory, there were six cities. And so, again, it, it just showed overall the complete wrong direction, how they, the pendulum had swung to the other side and how evil they were becoming. Verse 10, Hosea 6. I've seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There's harlotry of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. So this is the way that we started off in Hosea 1 too. And so it continues to be the theme and the problem. But what we have here is that Ephraim is the leader. And they led everyone in the wrong direction. They became spiritually corrupt and they went after foreign gods in these heretical ways. And now the rest of the 10 tribes are morally polluted. So that's what was happening then. They went into captivity. But here's the thing for us today is that it's happening now, even today. The UK, okay, who is modern day Ephraim, and we can go ahead and throw in the US since they're part of Israel, the, the, um, who, again, their name had been named on both of them, on Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's twin sons, right? They, okay, the UK and the US, should be, should have been leading the world today. But they have quickly abdicated this role as they continue to move away from God and move into, what, atheism, agnosticism, uh, pagan ways, foreign gods, other religions, etc., and they have forsaken God, right? And this is what he's talking about here. And because Ephraim is this way and not setting the example, everyone else is going to follow, right? And if, if we recall, many of the people, they saw Israel coming when they left uh, Egypt in the Exodus, and they heard of this God. And because you know, they followed God and God was with them and God intervened for them and God fought their battles. People knew the right God. And some people, you know, ended up joining the Israelites. Others obviously feared the Israelites and said, that is the God. How many people say that today? No, everybody thinks they get to do whatever is right in their own eyes. But the point here being is that it is a huge problem today, exactly like it was a huge problem with them, uh, them then, and the same type of thing is going to happen today, whether we believe it or not. Verse 11, Also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives of my people. So again, this message here is primarily going to we say Ephraim, who's the leader of Israel. So it's going to these people, right? But it's also going to Judah. And he's telling Judah, look, a harvest is appointed for you. Okay, this reaping of the people in the land where they're going to be taken into a foreign area and go into captivity, which is exactly what happened, right? So the message is also to Judah. So we can look at Israel, all of Israel or Jacob, together, Israel and Judah together. Again, look, we, we, we're always going to learn the lesson, should always take heed every lesson, even if it's going to somebody other than who it's pointed at. So it's going to Ephraim, right, who is the, supposed to be the leader of, um, 
of Israel among the tribes. The tribe of Ephraim is supposed to be the, the tribe that's leading, but they didn't do what they were supposed to. Israel, the lost ten tribes, all went up into captivity into Assyria. But he says, Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives of my people. So again, the, the, the people of, of Assyria, I mean of um, Israel, who went into Assyria, when Assyria was taken over by Babylon, they fled. They didn't go back to, to Israel. Okay? They fled up into Northwest Europe. And then, guess what? The, the harvest that was appointed to Judah was enacted, and they went into captivity into Babylon. So again, that was fulfilled for sure at this time. And again, how, how many times do we need to say, take heed, listen to what's happened, know what's going on before. Judah didn't listen. Okay, Israel didn't listen. And Judah saw Israel going to captivity. Well, here we are, you know, so many millennia later. And you know, I know it's, you know, we're looking back over 2,500 years, but still, we're, we're the same peoples and the same thing's going to happen. And it's incumbent upon us to learn that lesson, yet we know, you know, we're stubborn Israelites and it's going to happen just as God said it would. Chapter 7 now of Hosea. It says, verse 1, When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered, and the wickedness of Samaria, for they have committed fraud. A thief comes in, a band of robbers takes spoil outside. So what we see here then is this narrowing down, Israel being the, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes, to Ephraim, the one tribe who is supposed to be the leader. The name of Israel was named upon them. And, and because of that, certain blessings were going to go to them as well. To now to Samaria. Now Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so it was emblematic of this leadership of the nation. Samaria was built by King Omri and he remained steeped in idolatry all the way through its destruction some 30 years before the 10 tribes went into captivity in Assyria. So Israel could just never live correctly, or at least to an acceptable level in God's eyes. Verse 2, They do not consider in their own hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own deeds have surrounded them. They are before my face. So again, he's calling out the leadership here. All the lying, stealing, etc. that they were doing was ultimately against God. And they dismiss that. You know, they forget that God is this omnipresent God who knows everything and that he knows their sins and sees them that are before him all the time. Right? But they don't consider that. Even though sin is going on rampant around them and that those sins, which they forgot, would find them out. And they're piling up pretty heftily. Verse 3, they make a king glad with their wickedness and princes with their lies. So the king's happy that they're all sinning because this means that you know, not, they're not condemning him for his sins. So if they're doing the same thing or, or were just as bad, then somehow you know, the, key, the king felt a certain amount of vindication or relief for what he was doing. So it's like, well, you can't tell me to do something. You can't expect something of me if you're doing the same thing. So we see then here that he is, speak, again, speaking specifically to the rulers. Verse 4, they are all adulterers, like an oven heated by a baker. He ceases stirring the fire after the kneading the dough until it is leavened. So the people, these again, talking about these leaders here, Again, what we're seeing here, again, we, we talked about the, you know, this, what Samaria is emblematic of, the leadership, and that Ephraim's, again, supposed to be the leader of the ten tribes. And again, the ten tribes are supposed to be the example for the world. So again, nobody's getting away with the fact that they're supposed to be setting a good example. Now, it's talking about the leaders here, but again, apply where it needs to be applied. It says they are all adulterers. And they're like an oven heated by a baker. So they're burning in their lust and their fervency in, in 
for, to, to do wrong. They, they're uh, doing this in an illicit way, this, this burning desire that they have. So they're waiting, though, here for the opportunity to take advantage. So they're just, there's this oven that's heated up and it's just waiting for the, the, uh, the dough or the cake, the leavened bread to be put in. And then verse five, it says, in the day of our king princes, in the day of our king, princes have made him sick, inflamed with wine. He stretched out his hand with scoffers. So again, it's talking about the day of the king. Again, it's not completely uh, uh, seen here what this actually is, but it's more than likely it was something like his birthday or coronation. It was the, the day of the king, right? And then what you have is these princes who are influencing him in the wrong way, right? They, they've made him sick, inflamed with, with, with wine. So no doubt it was a day of debauchery for all of them. And he threw in his lot, you know, he, he stretched out his hand, as it says, with the scoffers. And so the king is in a position where he's not able to make a good judgment either. So again, because God's the one who sets up the kings, puts them in, and it's ultimately you know, responsible for them in terms of these physical people in the land, and, and he's being subject to the princes around him, the other leaders and it doesn't just stop with the princes. Verse 6, they prepare, again, talking about these leaders, okay, and also in terms of what they're doing to the king and trying to influence him. And we're going to see this in the, in the next couple of verses, how corrupt and how everyone was seeking power and the leadership because of what, it wasn't so that they could lead the uh, the Israelites to righteousness, as we'll see, but just because they had their own selfish ways that they wanted to meet. So they prepare their heart like an oven. Again, we're continuing uh, with, with this symbolism. While they lay, lie in wait, their baker sleeps all night. In the morning, it burns like a flaming fire. So they're... they're Lust and desire is seething overnight, and they're hot and bothered by it in the morning. So it's a continual attitude and point of view that they are subscribing to. And, uh, you know, Micah, I think, 2 1 talks about how, you know, they just lay awake all at night, just plotting and planning so that they can enact it in the morning. So, verse 7 they're hot, they're all hot, like an oven. They all you know, burn with this. Uh, illicit desire, and they have devoured their judges. Again, they're, they're looking at the, these people. The judges were the ones that were supposed to be saying, okay, you know, this is right and this is wrong, right? And of course, they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear right or wrong, especially the wrong. And so again, the judges fall at their hands. All their kings have fallen. None among them calls upon me. So they're doing what's right in their own eyes. They're not giving God a second thought. They're not considering their sins and the things that they're doing and the words that God had given them before in terms of the, the covenant and his law. And it says all their kings have fallen. So at this point in time and over the course of about the next 20 years, there are, uh, what is it, four or five assassinations and, and killings of the kings in their position. So it, it starts off, you, with Jeroboam the second, that's where we uh, started Hosea one one at was uh, Jeroboam the son of Joash. So Jeroboam the second was this son of Joash. Okay, then then you have Zechariah who is son of Jeroboam the second. Zechariah was killed. Okay, he was killed by Shalom who took over. Then Shalom lived, and then Menahem killed Shalom. And then you had Pekahiah, who was the son of Menahem, who managed to live for a, a little bit of time and to, to rule. And Pekah overthrew Pekahiah, and then Hosea overthrew Pekah. Now, what happened, though, is that you know, during, during Pekah, P-E-K-A-H, that uh, that was when the northern part of Israel was going into captivity. 
And then Hosea uh, took over for about a year, or for about, sorry, about 10 years. And he was the last king of Israel, and Samaria fell in 721 BC. And so, again, over the course of this time, he had assa assassinations and taking overs and overthrowing, and the kings were all falling, just like Hosea 7-7 seven, seven, had prophesied would happen. And it was because of the way that the leadership was acting. And, you know, sometimes I try to imagine what it's like to be a bad king, right? Because you look at people like Kim Jong-un, and it's like, I'm not imagining because I want to be, I'm imagining because I just don't even know how that, how do you have a decent night's sleep, right? You get people like Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-il and Saddam Hussein, etc. all these bad, bad guys throughout our, our recent history. And even today, like Putin, right? How is it that you you have any type of sanity while everybody else, you have to worry about everyone else you know, assassinating you, killing you, overthrowing you. You know, I, I read here not too long ago that Putin sacked 150 of, of these guys. And of course, right now, Russia and Ukraine are in at war and everybody wants to blame everybody else. And of course, you know, if Putin doesn't win, then his, uh, the people who are, 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 knocking at his door are going to have something, you know, his naysayers are going to, you know, gain some traction and people are going to say, yeah, we don't want Putin. We don't want them. And so, you know, Putin is getting rid of these people left and right. And in some cases, I'm sure he's killing them as he has, you know, done with many others in the past, allegedly. And so back then, how is it as a bad king, how do you maintain control? How do you maintain your sanity? How do you maintain your life? How do you continue to live from one day to the, the next, literally, whenever all this is going on? And, and this, is, this is what the problem was back then, is that it was just um, killing and killing one after the other of the kings. Exactly what Hosea said was going to happen. And again, the root cause of it was the lust of the heart and the leadership that was around them. And it continued to foment. And so Ephraim, the nation of Israel, was moving the wrong direction with its leadership, but also with the people uh, within the nation and around the nation. Hosea 7 verse 8. Ephraim has mixed himself among the peoples. Ephraim is a cake unturned. So Ephraim now trying to get strength and stability, is looking to make alliances with others. And because of that, he's influenced by them. And in the process of it, he adopts their ways, leaves gods behind. So he becomes this, like this cake unturned. He's burnt on one side, undo, undone and raw and doughy on the other. And so this cake, which is kind of like a pancake, is useless and it's no good for any purpose. Verse 9 Aliens, that's the strangers and foreigners that they mixed with, have devoured his strength, but he does not know it. Yes, gray hairs are here and there on him, yet he does not know it. So this mixing of the people in verse 8, have them pitting themselves against you, the, the strangers, the aliens, the foreigners, against you, and they're using up your resources, the blessings that you're given, and you're unaware of this fact. You grow weak and feeble like some old man without realizing your predicament. Again, this is where we are now in the UK and the US. It's the stranger, the alien, the foreigner within the gates that are devouring the strength. Okay, and it's all the others knocking at the door as well. And we have become weak and feeble and have not realized it. We, we continue to say how powerful and how strong we are. And yet, you know, when was the last time we actually won a war? You know, to me, you have to go all the way back to World War II. Okay, if you want a decisive victory, that's a long time ago. And if we look at what's going on right now, you know, the economy is falling apart. Of course, religion's out the door. 
right? Nobody, it's a, the most ludicrous thing, you know, if you want to listen to Obama, to, to rely on a God to defend you. you know, and it's like, yeah, people are, are shunning God left and right, and, and people are, are saying, well, I know what's right, and they're just starting to make up stuff, you know, out the side of their mouth. But as the economy goes south, and the taxes are not coming in to, to fund the government and the military, what do you think is going to happen to the military? We're no longer going to be able to uh, support all the military ventures that are going on around the world, right? much less here. So our strength is waning, and we don't know it. We don't realize it. And then one day, it's not going to be sufficient enough to protect us because God's not going to protect us because we haven't been looking to God. And this is how all this captivity is going to happen. Is that you know, God's not here and we've been relying on the wrong things and it's an inevitable conclusion. Verse 10. And the pride of Israel testifies to his face, but they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. So the pride goes before the fall. Okay. All the things that are going to happen will be a testimony to the way that we as a country or countries have acted by denying God. And even when we see this, we won't return to God initially. They're not going to seek him. They're going to continue to rely on other places, other powers. Verse 11. Ephraim also is like a silly dove. Without sense. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. So, again, they're flitting around trying to fix things and solve their problems in a silly manner. Instead of seeking God, they're going to look to men for help. The place that they should go should be obvious, but it's not to them. And so where do they, who do they call out to? The foreign nations. Wherever they go, verse 12, I will spread my net on them. I will bring them down like birds on the air. I will chastise them according to what their congregation has heard. So the law and the covenants that uh, were based on the laws that they said that they would keep, all the prophecies by the prophets that warned them time and time again what was coming and what they needed to do to turn around to avoid these atrocities in the future, and it's a punishment. All of the words of God written out for them in other words, they're without excuse. Woe to them, verse 13, for they have fled from me. Destruction to them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. He tried to spare them. He gave them warning after warning. They went away from God instead of running to God. Verse 14, They did not cry out to me with their heart when they wailed upon their beds. They assembled together for grain and new wine. They rebel against me. They didn't beseech God with a repentant heart for all the wrong things that they had done. But again, you know, the only time that they're going to cry out to God is when they don't like the punishment. Again, that's the wrong heart. But what did they do here instead? They assemble together for grain and new wine. So they come together, they assemble. Okay, This is a type of church service here. It's this ungodly rituals that they go to to seek for help instead of God. They're looking for this foreign pagan God for everything but the real God to provide help and sustenance instead of calling out on God as he had instructed them to do. Right? Jeremiah 29, verses 12 through 14, very specifically telling them what they need to do at this point in time that, again, he's saying they won't do. 
He's saying that we won't do with the coming problems of captivity and enslavement that are going to happen when this yoke is placed on this nation. It says, Jeremiah 29, verse 12 says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Again, they had the wrong heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I had driven you, says the Lord. I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. All right. So there's going to be a time in the future, okay, after this point in time here, where they will come to their senses and they will seek out God and they will not seek out man or false gods, false religion. And it's at that point in time that, yes, God will hear them, bring them out of the captivity that we saw there in verse 14, bring them back to the land where they were taken from, Israel, okay, and he will once again be their God. But in the meantime, he says, you're looking to the wrong gods here. And, you know, there, there was a confusion. And here's an interesting thing is that, you know, one of the names for Baal was Lord. And then all of a sudden that, well, the people are saying, okay, but we, we worship the Lord. And the reality is that they were worshiping Baal. And it's very similar to what's going on right now is that people believe that they are Christians. They believe that they're acting in a Christian manner, but they don't even follow the words of the Bible. They do whatever they want. Okay? They, they put their own narrative to the words of God and to the scriptures and don't let the Bible interpret the Bible. And because of this, you know, anything goes. You, you can find out, you can find whatever you want out there. And they're calling it Christianity. Yet, Christ is not in it any more than the Lord could refer to Baal ultimately and truly. Verse 15 of Hosea 7. Though I discipline and strengthen their arms, yet they devise evil against me. So God was their true source of their strength, and they failed to recognize that. He's the one that delivered them time and time again. Now, they're looking other places. They're looking elsewhere, right? To Syria, to Egypt, where they're not going to find the help that they need once God has removed his hand from them. Verse 16, Hosea 7. They return, but not to the Most High. They're like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the cursings of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. So they're like this treacherous bow. Again, a bow that doesn't work correctly. It misses its mark, which interestingly enough is like the definition for sin is that you miss the mark. Right? God says, here is what you to do. This is your goal, your aim, your target right here. But no, they miss the mark completely. And the prince says, okay, again, we've been talking about the leadership this whole time. Fall by the sword. So the leadership within the nation comes to nothing. Isaiah 10, verses 5 and 6. How does this happen? Again, well, one of the things is we know ahead of time, I mean, we know now what happened back then, right? And, and who it was that Israel went into captivity to. And it's going to be the same people. It's just going to be the modern day um, nation of Assyria. Well, who's that? Yeah, and we've talked about that before as well. It says, Isaiah 10, verses 5 and 6. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. God uses Israel okay, as his implement of punishment. Okay, as the rod of his anger. I will send him, Assyria, against an ungodly nation, meaning meaning the modern, or meaning Israel back then, but also meaning the modern day Israel, the U.S. and U.K., against the people of my wrath, and I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. So God allowed this. He, he removed his protection. 
He says, okay, the way I'm going to punish you is I'm going to send Assyria into the land. They're going to take you captive, captive and bring you out of the land. And that's what he did. And it's also what he's going to do in the future. And just to, to give it away so you don't have to go necessarily look it up on the website, but it'd be good to go and follow through on it all the way. But Assyria is modern day Germany. And it's going to be this German-led coalition of nations in Europe. They're going to be this power that God's once again going to use in the future. It's going to be the beast power that God's going to use to bring his people into captivity and to punish them once again. It won't be just them. That It won't be just to Germany they go. And again, we, we've talked about this, but Isaiah 11, 11 and 12 shows all these places that they're going to go and even to the, the four corners. And I won't bother to read it all, but just to point out in verse 11, it, it says, you know, he goes to recover the people who are left from Assyria and Egypt. And that's who we're talking about at, at the moment in the last few verses here of chapter seven. But notice here it says, this shall be their derision in the land of Egypt in, in Hosea seven sixteen. So a lot of times when you're talking about Egypt alone. It can be symbolic of sin. You know, come out of sin. Come out of Egypt. And so it can refer to it, you know, symbolically. But when you actually see the land of Egypt, it's typically referring to the place. So what we have here then is a reference to the future, right? Because when Israel of old went out, they went up to Assyria and from Assyria, they went northwest to uh, Europe. Okay, if you know Egypt and your geography, it's to the south of Israel. That's not the direction that they went. Okay, it's not where they went as a part of their captivity and punishment at that time. But in the future it will, as we saw in Isaiah 11, 11, is that God goes and he has to recover them from Assyria and Egypt and then all the other places. And, and then again, the four corners of the earth. So what we see then is more specifically how this is a prophecy for what's to come in the future. And the reason that this happens, okay, it says they return, but not to the most high. Okay. So again, the word there for return is this word shub, which again means to repent. Same thing, return, repent, turn around, come back to God where they had left. They had this relationship with them. And he gave them their law and said, okay, this is how you regulate your life. This is the best way to live, right? It's not this burdensome and, and heavy yoke that you have to bear. No, it's liberating and freeing. It leads to blessings and life. But they said, nope, we're, you know, we're not going to return to God. And so because of the way that they acted... They then, the, because of the way that we are acting right now, okay, for the, the cursings of, of our tongue, the, the things that we say that we shouldn't be saying and the things that we do that we shouldn't be doing, okay, this is going to be what is going to happen in the future, is that there is a coming captivity on Israel as well as the people of Judah. But again, the focus in this chapter has been on not just Israel, but narrowing it down to Ephraim, not just Ephraim, but on the leadership of Samaria. So it puts a lot of the blame upon the leadership in the fact that they are not leading in the right direction. How long has it been, or if ever, that there's been a godly man in office? It's leading people to God this leading the country by the word of God. Just go back through your mind and you find that, okay, now you see why the country, the countries are in the state of disarray that they are in today. And if we have ears to hear and eyes to see, we can see why it's going to happen, why the punishment is going to come upon the people of this land. And it, it makes these books you know, of the Bible, these prophecies, so relevant for us today.